2. The Anatomy of Consciousness At certain times in history, cultures have taken it for granted that a person wasn't fully human unless he or she learned to master thoughts and feelings. In Confucian China, in ancient Sparta, in Republican Rome, in the early pilgrim settlements of New England, and among the British upper classes of the Victorian era, people were held responsible for keeping a tight rein on their emotions. Anyone who indulged in self-pity, who let instinct rather than reflection dictate actions, forfeited the right to be accepted as a member of the community. In other historical periods, such as the one in which we are now living, the ability to control oneself is not held in high esteem. People who attempt it are thought to be faintly ridiculous, uptight, or not quite with it. But whatever the dictates of fashion, it seems that those who take the trouble to gain mastery over what happens in consciousness do live a happier life. To achieve such mastery, it is obviously important to understand how consciousness works. In the present chapter, we shall take a step in that direction. To begin with, and just to clear the air of any suspicion that in talking about consciousness we are referring to some mysterious process, we should recognize that, like every other dimension of human behavior, it is the result of biological processes. It exists only because of the incredibly complex architecture of our nervous system, which in turn is built up according to instructions contained in the protein molecules of our chromosomes. At the same time, we should also recognize that the way in which consciousness works is not entirely controlled by its biological programming. In many important respects that we shall review in the pages that follow, it is self-directed. In other words, consciousness has developed the ability to override its genetic instructions and to set its own independent course of action. The function of consciousness is to represent information about what is happening outside and inside the organism in such a way that it can be evaluated and acted upon by the body. In this sense, it functions as a clearinghouse for sensations, perceptions, feelings, and ideas, establishing priorities among all the diverse information. Without consciousness, we would still know what is going on, but we would have to react to it in a reflexive, instinctive way. With consciousness, we can deliberately weigh what the senses tell us and respond accordingly. And we can also invent information that did not exist before. It is because we have consciousness that we can daydream, make up lies, and write beautiful poems and scientific theories. Over the endless dark centuries of its evolution, the human nervous system has become so complex that it is now able to affect its own states, making it to a certain extent functionally independent of its genetic blueprint and of the objective environment. A person can make himself happy or miserable, regardless of what is actually happening outside, just by changing the contents of consciousness. We all know individuals who can transform hopeless situations into challenges to be overcome, just through the force of their personalities. This ability to persevere despite obstacles and setbacks is the quality people most admire in others, and justly so. It is probably the most important trait not only for succeeding in life, but for enjoying it as well. To develop this trait, one must find ways to order consciousness so as to be in control of feelings and thoughts. It is best not to expect that shortcuts will do the trick. Some people have a tendency to become very mystical when talking about consciousness and expect it to accomplish miracles that at present it is not designed to perform. They would like to believe that anything is possible in what they think of as the spiritual realm. Other individuals claim the power to channel into past existences, to communicate with spiritual entities, and to perform uncanny feats of extrasensory perception. When not outright frauds, these accounts usually turn out to be self-delusions, lies that an overly receptive mind tells itself. The remarkable accomplishments of Hindu fakirs and other practitioners of mental disciplines are often presented as examples of the unlimited powers of the mind and with more justification. But even many of these claims do not hold up under investigation, and the ones that do can be explained in terms of the extremely specialized training of a normal mind. After all, Mystical explanations are not necessary to account for the performance of a great violinist or a great athlete, even though most of us could not even begin to approach their powers. The yogi, similarly, is a virtuoso of the control of consciousness. Like all virtuosi, 
he must spend many years learning, and he must keep constantly in training. Being a specialist, he cannot afford the time or the mental energy to do anything other than fine-tune his skill at manipulating inner experiences. The skills the yogi gains are at the expense of the more mundane abilities that other people learn to develop and take for granted. What an individual yogi can do is amazing, but so is what a plumber can do or a good mechanic. Perhaps in time we shall discover hidden powers of the mind that will allow it to make the sort of quantum leaps that now we can only dream about. There is no reason to rule out the possibility that eventually we shall be able to bend spoons with brainwaves. But at this point, when there are so many more mundane but no less urgent tasks to accomplish, it seems a waste of time to lust for powers beyond our reach, when consciousness, with all its limitations, could be employed so much more effectively. Although in its present state it cannot do what some people would wish it to do, the mind has enormous untapped potential that we desperately need to learn how to use. Because no branch of science deals with consciousness directly, there is no single accepted description of how it works. Many disciplines touch on it and thus provide peripheral accounts. Neuroscience, neuroanatomy, cognitive science, artificial intelligence, psychoanalysis, and phenomenology are some of the most directly relevant fields to choose from. However, trying to summarize their findings would result in an account similar to the descriptions the blind men gave of the elephant, each different and each unrelated to the others. No doubt we shall continue to learn important things about consciousness from these disciplines. But in the meantime, we are left with the task of providing a model that is grounded in fact, yet expressed simply enough so that anyone can make use of it. Although it sounds like indecipherable academic jargon, the most concise description of the approach I believe to be the clearest way to examine the main facets of what happens in the mind in a way that can be useful in the actual practice of everyday life is a phenomenological model of consciousness based on information theory. This representation of consciousness is phenomenological in that it deals directly with events, phenomena, as we experience and interpret them, rather than focusing on the anatomical structures, neurochemical processes, or unconscious purposes that make these events possible. Of course, it is understood that whatever happens in the mind is the result of electrochemical changes in the central nervous system, as laid down over millions of years by biological evolution. But phenomenology assumes that a mental event can be best understood if we look at it directly as it was experienced, rather than through the specialized optics of a particular discipline. Yet in contrast to pure phenomenology, which intentionally excludes any other theory or science from its method, the model we will explore here adopts principles from information theory as being relevant for understanding what happens in consciousness. These principles include knowledge about how sensory data are processed, stored, and used, the dynamics of attention and memory. With this framework in mind, what then does it mean to be conscious? It simply means that certain specific conscious events, sensations, feelings, thoughts, intentions, are occurring and that we are able to direct their course. In contrast, when we are dreaming, some of the same events are present, yet we are not conscious because we cannot control them. For instance, I may dream of having received news of a relative's being involved in an accident, and I may feel very upset. I might think I wish I could be of help. Despite the fact that I perceive, feel, think, and form intentions in the dream, I cannot act on these processes by making provisions for checking out the truthfulness of the news, for example, and hence I am not conscious. In dreams, we are locked into a single scenario we cannot change at will. The events that constitute consciousness, the things we see, feel, think, and desire, are information that we can manipulate and use. Thus, we might think of consciousness as intentionally ordered information. This dry definition, accurate as it is, does not fully suggest the importance of what it conveys. Since for us, outside events do not exist unless we are aware of them, consciousness corresponds to subjectively experienced reality. While everything we feel, smell, hear, or remember is potentially a candidate for entering consciousness, the experiences that actually do become part of it are much fewer than those left out. Thus, 
While consciousness is a mirror that reflects what our senses tell us about what happens both outside our bodies and within the nervous system, it reflects those changes selectively, actively shaping events, imposing on them a reality of its own. The reflection consciousness provides is what we call our life. The sum of all we have heard, seen, felt, hoped, and suffered from birth to death. Although we believe that there are things outside consciousness, we have direct evidence only of those that find a place in it. As the central clearinghouse in which varied events processed by different senses can be represented and compared, consciousness can contain a famine in Africa, the smell of a rose, the performance of the Dow Jones, and a plan to stop at the store to buy some bread all at the same time. But that does not mean that its content is a shapeless jumble. We may call intentions the force that keeps information in consciousness ordered. Intentions arise in consciousness whenever a person is aware of desiring something or wanting to accomplish something. Intentions are also bits of information, shaped either by biological needs or by internalized social goals. They act as magnetic fields, what moving attention towards some objects and away from others, keeping our mind focused on some stimuli in preference to others. We often call the manifestation of intentionality by other names, such as instinct, need, drive, or desire. But these are all explanatory terms, telling us why people behave in certain ways. Intention is a more neutral and descriptive term. It doesn't say why a person wants to do a certain thing, but simply states that he does. For instance, whenever blood sugar level drops below a critical point, we start feeling uneasy. We might feel irritable and sweaty and get stomach cramps. Because of genetically programmed instructions to restore the level of sugar in the blood, we might start thinking about food. We will look for food until we eat and are no longer hungry. In this instance, we could say that it was the hunger drive that organized the content of consciousness, forcing us to focus attention on food. But this is already an interpretation of the facts, no doubt chemically accurate, but phenomenologically irrelevant. The hungry person is not aware of the level of sugar in his bloodstream. He knows only that there is a bit of information in his consciousness that he has learned to identify the fighterless, if as hunger. Once the person is aware that he is hungry, he might very well form the intention of obtaining some food. If he does so, his behavior will be the same as if he were simply obeying a need or drive. But alternatively, he could disregard the pangs of hunger entirely. He might have some stronger and opposite intentions, such as losing weight or wanting to save money or fasting for religious reasons. Sometimes, as in the case of political protesters who wish to starve themselves to death, the intention of making an ideological statement might override genetic instructions, resulting in voluntary death. The intentions we either inherit or acquire are organized M hierarchies of goals, which specify the order of precedence among them. For the protester, achieving a given political reform may be more important than anything else, life included. That one goal takes precedence over all others. Most people, however, adopt sensible goals based on the needs of their body, to live a long and healthy life, to have sex, to be well-fed and comfortable, or on the desires implanted by the social system, to be good, to work hard, to spend as much as possible, to live up to others' expectations. But there are enough exceptions in every culture to show that goals are quite flexible. Individuals who depart from the norms, heroes, saints, sages, artists, and poets, as well as madmen and criminals, look for different things in life than most others do. The existence of people like these shows that consciousness can be ordered in terms of different goals and intentions. Each of us has this freedom to control our subjective reality. The Limits of Consciousness if it were possible to expand indefinitely what consciousness is able to encompass, one of the most fundamental dreams of humankind would come true. It would be almost as good as being immortal or omnipotent, in short, godlike. We could think everything, feel everything, do everything, scan through so much information that we could fill up every fraction of a second with a rich tapestry of experiences. In the space of a lifetime, we could go through a million, or why not, through an infinite number of lives. Unfortunately, the nervous system has definite limits on how much information it can process at any given time. 
there are just so many events that can appear in consciousness and be recognized and handled appropriately before they begin to crowd each other out. Walking across a room while chewing gum at the same time is not too difficult, even though some statesmen have been alleged to be unable to do it, but in fact there is not that much more that can be done concurrently. Thoughts have to follow each other, or they get jumbled. While we are thinking about a problem, we cannot truly experience either happiness or sadness. We cannot run, sing, and balance the checkbook simultaneously, because each one of these activities exhausts most of our capacity for attention. At this point in our scientific knowledge, we are on the verge of being able to estimate how much information the central nervous system is capable of processing. It seems we can manage at most seven bits of information, such as differentiated sounds or visual stimuli or recognizable nuances of emotion or thought at any one time, and that the shortest time it takes to discriminate between one set of bits and another is about is of a second. By using these figures, one concludes that it is possible to process at most 126 bits of information per second, or 7,560 per minute, or almost half a million per hour. Over a lifetime of 70 years, and counting 16 hours of waking time each day, this amounts to about 185 billion bits of information. It is out of this total that everything in our life must come, every thought, memory, feeling, or action. It seems like a huge amount, but in reality it does not go that far. The limitation of consciousness is demonstrated by the fact that to understand what another person is saying, we must process 40 bits of information each second. If we assume the upper limit of our capacity to be 126 bits per second, it follows that to understand what three people are saying simultaneously is theoretically possible, but only by managing to keep out of consciousness every other thought or sensation. We couldn't, for instance, be aware of the speaker's expressions, nor could we wonder about why they are saying what they are saying, or notice what they are wearing. Of course, these figures are only suggestive at this point in our knowledge of the way the mind works. It could be argued justifiably that they either underestimate or overestimate the capacity of the mind to process information. The optimists claim that through the course of evolution, the nervous system has become adept at chunking bits of information so that processing capacity is constantly expanded. Simple functions like adding a column of numbers or driving a car grow to be automated leaving the mind free to deal with more data. We also learn how to compress and streamline information through symbolic means, language, math, abstract concepts, and stylized narratives. Each biblical parable, for instance, tries to encode the hard-won experience of many individuals over unknown eons of time. Consciousness, the optimists argue, is an open system. In effect, it is infinitely expandable, and there is no need to take its limitations into account. But the ability to compress stimuli does not help as much as one might expect. The requirements of life still dictate that we spend about 8% of waking time eating, and almost the same amount taking care of personal bodily needs, such as washing, dressing, shaving, and going to the bathroom. These two activities alone take up 15% of consciousness, and while engaged in them, we can't do much else that requires serious concentration. But even when there is nothing else pressing occupying their minds, most people fall far below the peak capacity for processing information. In the roughly one-third of the day that is free of obligations, in their precious leisure time, most people in fact seem to use their minds as little as possible. The largest part of free time, almost half of it for American adults, is spent in front of the television set. The plots and characters of the popular shows are so repetitive that although watching TV requires the processing of visual images, very little else in the way of memory, thinking, or volition is required. Not surprisingly, people report some of the lowest levels of concentration, use of skills, clarity of thought, and feelings of potency when watching television. The other leisure activities people usually do at home are only a little more demanding reading most newspapers and magazines, talking to other people, and gazing out the window also involve processing very little new information and thus require little concentration. So the 185 billion events to be enjoyed over our mortal days might be either an overestimate or an underestimate. 
If we consider the amount of data the brain could theoretically process, the number might be too low. But if we look at how people actually use their minds, it is definitely much too high. In any case, an individual can experience only so much. Therefore, the information we allow into consciousness becomes extremely important. It is, in fact, what determines the content and the quality of life. Attention as psychic energy. Information enters consciousness either because we intend to focus attention on it or as a result of attentional habits based on biological or social instructions. For instance, driving down the highway, we pass hundreds of cars without actually being aware of them. Their shape and color might register for a fraction of a second and then they are immediately forgotten. But occasionally we notice a particular vehicle, perhaps because it is swerving unsteadily between lanes or because it is moving very slowly, or because of its unusual appearance. The image of the unusual car enters the focus of consciousness, and we become aware of it. In the mind, the visual information about the car, e.g. it is swerving, gets related to information about other errant cars stored in memory to determine into which category the present instance fits. Is this an inexperienced driver, a drunken driver, a momentarily distracted but competent driver? As soon as the event is matched to an already known class of events, it is identified. Now it must be evaluated. Is this something to worry about? If the answer is yes, then we must decide on an appropriate course of action. Should we speed up, slow down, change lanes, stop and alert the highway patrol? All these complex mental operations must be completed in a few seconds, sometimes in a fraction of a second. While forming such a judgment seems to be a lightning-fast reaction, it does take place in real time, and it does not happen automatically. There is a distinct process that makes such reactions possible, a process called attention. It is attention that selects the relevant bits of information from the potential millions of bits available. It takes attention to retrieve the appropriate references from memory, to evaluate the event, and then to choose the right thing to do. Despite its great powers, attention cannot step beyond the limits already described. It cannot notice or hold in focus more information than can be processed simultaneously. Retrieving information from memory storage and bringing it into the focus of awareness, comparing information, evaluating, deciding, all make demands on the mind's limited processing capacity. For example, the driver who notices the swerving car will have to stop talking on his cellular phone if he wants to avoid an accident. Some people learn to use this priceless resource efficiently while others waste it. The mark of a person who is in control of consciousness is the ability to focus attention at will, to be oblivious to distractions, to concentrate for as long as it takes to achieve a goal, and not longer. And the person who can do this usually enjoys the normal course of everyday life. Two very different individuals come to mind to illustrate how attention can be used to order consciousness in the service of one's goals. The first is E, a European woman who is one of the best known and powerful women in her country, a scholar of international reputation. She has at the same time built up a thriving business that employs hundreds of people and has been on the cutting edge of its field for a generation. E travels constantly to political, business, and professional meetings, moving among her several residences around the world. If there is a concert in the town where she is staying, E will probably be in the audience. At the first free moment, she will be at the museum or library. And while she is in a meeting, her chauffeur, instead of just standing around and waiting, will be expected to visit the local art gallery or museum. For on the way home, his employer will want to discuss what he thought of its paintings. Not one minute of E's life is wasted. Usually she is writing, solving problems, reading one of the five newspapers or the earmarked sections of books on her daily schedule, or just asking questions, watching curiously what is going on and planning her next task. Very little of her time is spent on the routine functions of life. Chatting or socializing out of mere politeness is done graciously, but avoided whenever possible. Each day, however, she devotes some time to recharging her mind by such simple means as standing still for 15 minutes on the lakeshore facing the sun with eyes closed, or she may take her hounds for a walk in the meadows on the hill outside town. 
E, is so much in control of her attentional processes that she can disconnect her consciousness at will and fall asleep for a refreshing nap whenever she has a moment free. E's life has not been easy. Her family became impoverished after World War I, and she herself lost everything, including her freedom, during World War II. Several decades ago, she had a chronic disease her doctors were sure was fatal. But she recovered everything, including her health, by disciplining her attention and refusing to diffuse it on unproductive thoughts or activities. At this point, she radiates a pure glow of energy. And despite past hardships and the intensity of her present life, she seems to relish thoroughly every minute of it. The second person who comes to mind is in many ways the opposite of E, the only similarity being the same unbending sharpness of attention. R is a slight at first sight unprepossessing man. Shy, modest to the point of self-effacement, he would be easy to forget immediately after a short meeting. Although he is known to only a few, his reputation among them is very great. He is master of an arcane branch of scholarship, and at the same time the author of exquisite verse translated into many languages. Every time one speaks to him, the image of a deep well full of energy comes to mind. As he talks, his eyes take in everything. Every sentence he hears is analyzed three or four different ways, even before the speaker has finished saying it. Things that most people take for granted puzzle him, and until he figures them out in an original yet perfectly appropriate way, he will not let them be. Yet despite this constant effort of focused intelligence, R gives the impression of restfulness, of calm serenity. He always seems aware of the tiniest ripples of activity in his surroundings, but R does not notice things in order to change them or judge them. He is content to register reality, to understand, and then perhaps to express his understanding. R is not going to make the immediate impact on society that E has, but his consciousness is just as ordered and complex. His attention is stretched as far as it can go, interacting with the world around him. And like E, he seems to enjoy his life intensely. Each person allocates his or her limited attention, either by focusing it intentionally, like a beam of energy, as do E and R in the previous examples, or by diffusing it in desultory, random movements. The shape and content of life depend on how attention has been used. Entirely different realities will emerge depending on how it is invested. The names we use to describe personality traits, such as extrovert, high achiever, or paranoid, refer to the specific patterns people have used to structure their attention. At the same party, the extrovert will seek out and enjoy interactions with others, the high achiever will look for useful business contacts, and the paranoid will be on guard for signs of danger he must avoid. Attention can be invested in innumerable ways, ways that can make life either rich or miserable. The flexibility of attentional structures is even more obvious when they are compared across cultures or occupational classes. Eskimo hunters are trained to discriminate between dozens of types of snow and are always aware of the direction and speed of the wind. Traditional Melanesian sailors can be taken blindfolded to any point of the ocean within a radius of several hundred miles from their island home and, if allowed to float for a few minutes in the sea, are able to recognize the spot by the feel of the currents on their bodies. A musician structures her attention so as to focus on nuances of sound that ordinary people are not aware of. A stockbroker focuses on tiny changes in the market that others do not register. A good clinical diagnostician has an uncanny eye for symptoms because they have trained their attention to process signals that otherwise would pass unnoticed. Because attention determines what will or will not appear in consciousness, and because it is also required to make any other mental events such as remembering, thinking, feeling, and making decisions happen there, it is useful to think of it as psychic energy. Attention is like energy in that without it, no work can be done, and in doing work, it is dissipated. We create ourselves by how we invest this energy. Memories, thoughts, and feelings are all shaped by how we use it, and it is an energy under our control, to do with as we please. Hence, attention is our most important tool in the task of improving the quality of experience. Enter the self. But what do those first-person pronouns refer to in the lines above? those Wes and R.S. that are supposed to control attention. 
Where is the I, the entity that decides what to do with the psychic energy generated by the nervous system? Where does the captain of the ship, the master of the soul, reside? As soon as we consider these questions for even a short while, we realize that the I, or the self, as we shall refer to it from now on, is also one of the contents of consciousness. It is one that never strays very far from the focus of attention. Of course, my own self exists solely in my own consciousness. In that of others who know me, there will be versions of it, most of them probably unrecognizable likenesses of the original, myself as I see me. The self is no ordinary piece of information, however. In fact, it contains everything else that has passed through consciousness. All the memories, actions, desires, pleasures, and pains are included in it. And more than anything else, the self represents the hierarchy of goals that we have built up, bit by bit, over the years. The self of the political activist may become indistinguishable from his ideology. The self of the banker may become wrapped up in his investments. Of course, ordinarily we do not think of ourself in this way. At any given time, we are usually aware of only a tiny part of it, as when we become conscious of how we look, of what impression we are making, or of what we really would like to do if we could. We most often associate ourself with our body, though sometimes we extend its boundaries to identify it with a car, house, or family. Yet, however much we are aware of it, the self is in many ways the most important element of consciousness, for it represents symbolically all of consciousness's other contents as well as the pattern of their interrelations. The patient reader who has followed the argument so far might detect at this point a faint trace of circularity. If attention or psychic energy is directed by the self, and if the self is the sum of the contents of consciousness and the structure of its goals, and if the contents of consciousness and the goals are the result of different ways of investing attention, then we have a system that is going round and round, with no clear causes or effects. At one point we are saying that the self directs attention, at another that attention determines the self. In fact, both these statements are true. Consciousness is not a strictly linear system, but one in which circular causality obtains. Attention shapes the self and is in turn shaped by it. An example of this type of causality is the experience of Sam Browning, one of the adolescents we have followed in our longitudinal research studies. Sam went to Bermuda for a Christmas holiday with his father when he was 15. At the time, he had no idea of what he wanted to do with his life. His self was relatively unformed, without an identity of its own. Sam had no clearly differentiated goals. He wanted exactly what other boys his age are supposed to want, either because of their genetic programs or because of what the social environment told them to want. In other words, he thought vaguely of going to college, then later finding some kind of well-paying job, getting married, and living somewhere in the suburbs. In Bermuda, Sam's father took him on an excursion to a coral barrier, and they dove underwater to explore the reef. Sam couldn't believe his eyes. He found the mysterious, beautifully dangerous environment so enchanting that he decided to become more familiar with it. He ended up taking a number of biology courses in high school and is now in the process of becoming a marine scientist. In Sam's case, an accidental event imposed itself on his consciousness, the challenging beauty of life in the ocean. He had not planned to have this experience. It was not the result of his self or his goals having directed attention to it. But once he became aware of what went on undersea, Sam liked it. The experience resonated with previous things he had enjoyed doing, with feelings he had about nature and beauty, with priorities about what was important that he had established over the years. He felt the experience was something good, something worth seeking out again. Thus he built this accidental event into a structure of goals. To learn more about the ocean, to take courses, to go on to college and graduate school, to find a job as a marine biologist, which became a central element of his self. From then on, his goals directed Sam's attention to focus more and more closely on the ocean and on its life, thereby closing the circle of causality. At first, attention helped to shape his self when he noticed the beauties of the underwater world he had been exposed to by accident. Later, as he intentionally sought knowledge in marine biology, his self began to shape his attention. 
There is nothing very unusual about Sam's case, of course. Most people develop their attentional structures in similar ways. At this point, almost all the components needed to understand how consciousness can be controlled are in place. We have seen that experience depends on the way we invest psychic energy, on the structure of attention. This, in turn, is related to goals and intentions. These processes are connected to each other by the self, or the dynamic mental representation we have of the entire system of our goals. These are the pieces that must be maneuvered if we wish to improve things. Of course, existence can also be improved by outside events, like winning a million dollars in the lottery, marrying the right man or woman, or helping to change an unjust social system. But even these marvelous events must take their place in consciousness and be connected in positive ways to ourself before they can affect the quality of life. The structure of consciousness is beginning to emerge, but so far we have a rather static picture, one that has sketched out the various elements, but not the processes through which they interact. We need now consider what follows whenever attention brings a new bit of information into awareness. Only then will we be ready to get a thorough sense of how experience can be controlled and hence changed for the better. Disorder in Consciousness, Psychic Entropy One of the main forces that affects consciousness adversely is psychic disorder, that is, information that conflicts with existing intentions or distracts us from carrying them out. We give this condition many names depending on how we experience it. Pain, fear, rage, anxiety, or jealousy. All these varieties of disorder force attention to be diverted to undesirable objects, leaving us no longer free to use it according to our preferences. Psychic energy becomes unwieldy and ineffective. Consciousness can become disordered in many ways. For instance, in a factory that produces audiovisual equipment, Julio Martinez, one of the people we studied with the experience sampling method, is feeling listless on his job. As the movie projectors pass in front of him on the assembly line, he is distracted and can hardly keep up the rhythm of moves necessary for soldering the connections that are his responsibility. Usually he can do his part of the job with time to spare and then relax for a while to exchange a few jokes before the next unit stops at his station. But today he is struggling and occasionally he slows down the entire line. When the man at the next station kids him about it, Julio snaps back irritably. From morning to quitting time, tension keeps building, and it spills over to his relationship with his co-workers. Julio's problem is simple, almost trivial, but it has been weighing heavily on his mind. One evening a few days earlier, he noticed on arriving home from work that one of his tires was quite low. Next morning, the rim of the wheel was almost touching the ground. Julio would not receive his paycheck till the end of the following week and he was certain he would not have enough money until then to have the tire patched up, let alone buy a new one. Credit was something he had not yet learned to use. The factory was out in the suburbs, about 20 miles from where he lived, and he simply had to reach it by 8 a.m. The only solution Julio could think of was to drive gingerly to the service station in the morning, fill the tire with air, and then drive to work as quickly as possible. After work, the tire was low again, so he inflated it at a gas station near the factory and drove home. On the morning in question, he had been doing this for three days, hoping the procedure would work until the next paycheck. But today, by the time he made it to the factory, he could hardly steer the car because the wheel with the bum tire was so flat. All through the day, he worried. Will I make it home tonight? How will one get to work tomorrow morning? These questions kept intruding in his mind, disrupting concentration on his work and throwing a pall on his moods. Julio is a good example of what happens when the internal order of the self is disrupted. The basic pattern is always the same. Some information that conflicts with an individual's goals appears in consciousness. Depending on how central that goal is to the self and on how severe the threat to it is, some amount of attention will have to be mobilized to eliminate the danger leaving less attention free to deal with other matters. For Julio, holding a job was a goal of very high priority. If he were to lose it, all his other goals would be compromised. Therefore, keeping it was essential to maintain the order of his self. The flat tire was jeopardizing the job. 
and consequently it absorbed a great deal of his psychic energy. Whenever information disrupts consciousness by threatening its goals, we have a condition of inner disorder, or psychic entropy, a disorganization of the self that impairs its effectiveness. Prolonged experiences of this kind can weaken the self to the point that it is no longer able to invest attention and pursue its goals. Julio's problem was relatively mild and transient. A more chronic example of psychic entropy is the case of Jim Harris, a greatly talented high school sophomore who was in one of our surveys. Alone at home on a Wednesday afternoon, he was standing in front of the mirror in the bedroom his parents used to share. On the box at his feet, a tape of The Grateful Dead was playing, as it had been almost without interruption for the past week. Jim was trying on one of his father's favorite garments, a heavy green chamois shirt his father had worn whenever the two had gone camping together. Passing his hand over the warm fabric, Jim remembered the cozy feeling of being snuggled up to his dad in the smoky tent while the loons were laughing across the lake. In his right hand, Jim was holding a pair of large sewing scissors. The sleeves were too long for him, and he was wondering if he dared to trim them. Dad would be furious, or would he even notice? A few hours later, Jim was lying in his bed. On the nightstand beside him was a bottle of aspirin, now empty, although there had been 70 tablets in it just a while before. Jim's parents had separated a year earlier, and now they were getting a divorce. During the week while he was in school, Jim lived with his mother. Friday evenings, he packed up to go and stay in his father's new apartment in the suburbs. One of the net problems with this arrangement was that he was never able to be with his friends. During the week, they were all too busy, and on weekends, Jim was stranded in foreign territory where he knew nobody. He spent his free time on the phone, trying to make connections with his friends or he listened to tapes that he felt echoed the solitude gnawing inside him. But the worst thing Jim felt was that his parents were constantly battling for his loyalty. They kept making snide remarks about each other, trying to make Jim feel guilty if he showed any interest or love toward one in the presence of the other. Help, he scribbled in his diary a few days before his attempted suicide. I don't want to hate my mom. I don't want to hate my dad. I wish they stopped doing this to me. Luckily that evening, Jim's sister noticed the empty bottle of aspirin and called her mother, and Jim ended up in the hospital, where his stomach was pumped and he was set back on his feet in a few days. Thousands of kids his age are not that fortunate. The flat tire that threw Julio into a temporary panic and the divorce that almost killed Jim don't act directly as physical causes producing a physical effect, as, for instance, one billiard ball hitting another and making it carom in a predictable direction. The outside event appears in consciousness purely as information, without necessarily having a positive or negative value attached to it. It is the self that interprets that raw information in the context of its own interests and determines whether it is harmful or not. For instance, if Julio had had more money or some credit, his problem would have been perfectly innocuous, if, in the past, he had invested more psychic energy in making friends on the job, the flat tire would not have created panic, because he could have always asked one of his co-workers to give him a ride for a few days. And if he had had a stronger sense of self-confidence, the temporary setback would not have affected him as much, because he would have trusted his ability to overcome it eventually. Similarly, if Jim had been more independent, the divorce would not have affected him as deeply. But, at his age, his goals must have still been bound up too closely with those of his mother and father, so that the split between them also split his sense of self. Had he had closer friends or a longer record of goals successfully achieved, his self would have had the strength to maintain its integrity. He was lucky that after the breakdown, his parents realized the predicament and sought help for themselves and their son, re-establishing a stable enough relationship with Jim to allow him to go on with the task of building a sturdy self. Every piece of information we process gets evaluated for its bearing on the self. Does it threaten our goals? Does it support them? Or is it neutral? News of the fall of the stock market will upset the banker, but it might reinforce the sense of self of the political activist. 
a new piece of information will either create disorder in consciousness by getting us all worked up to face the threat, or it will reinforce our goals, thereby freeing up psychic energy. Order in consciousness, flow. The opposite state from the condition of psychic entropy is optimal experience. When the information that keeps coming into awareness is congruent with goals, psychic energy flows effortlessly. There is no need to worry, no reason to question one's adequacy. But whenever one does stop to think about oneself, the evidence is encouraging. You are doing all right. The positive feedback strengthens the self, and more attention is freed to deal with the outer and the inner environment. Another one of our respondents, a worker named Rico Medellin, gets this feeling quite often on his job. He works in the same factory as Julio, a little further up on the assembly line. The task he has to perform on each unit that passes in front of his station should take 43 seconds to perform. The same exact operation almost 600 times in a working day. Most people would grow tired of such work very soon. But Rico has been at this job for over five years, and he still enjoys it. The reason is that he approaches his task in the same way an Olympic athlete approaches his event. How can I beat my record? Like the runner who trains for years to shave a few seconds off his best performance on the track, Rico has trained himself to better his time on the assembly line. With the painstaking care of a surgeon, he has worked out a private routine for how to use his tools, how to do his moves. After five years, his best average for a day has been 28 seconds per unit. In part, he tries to improve his performance to earn a bonus and the respect of his supervisors. But most often, he does not even let on to others that he is ahead and lets his success pass unnoticed. It is enough to know that he can do it, because when he is working at top performance, the experience is so enthralling that it is almost painful for him to slow down. It's better than anything else, Rico says. It's a whole lot better than watching TV. Rico knows that very soon he will reach the limit beyond which he will no longer be able to improve his performance at his job. So twice a week, he takes evening courses in electronics. When he has his diploma, he will seek a more complex job, one that, presumably, he will confront with the same enthusiasm he has shown so far. For Pam Davis, it is much easier to achieve this harmonious, effortless state when she works. As a young lawyer in a small partnership, she is fortunate to be involved in complex, challenging cases. She spends hours in the library, chasing down references and outlining possible courses of action for the senior partners of the firm to follow. Often her concentration is so intense that she forgets to have lunch, and by the time she realizes that she is hungry, it is dark outside. While she is immersed in her job, every piece of information fits. Even when she is temporarily frustrated, she knows what causes the frustration, and she believes that eventually the obstacle can be overcome. These examples illustrate what we mean by optimal experience. They are situations in which attention can be freely invested to achieve a person's goals because there is no disorder to straighten out, no threat for the self to defend against. We have called this state the flow experience because this is the term many of the people we interviewed had used in their descriptions of how it felt to be in top form. It was like floating. I was carried on by the flow. It is the opposite of psychic entropy. In fact, it is sometimes called negentropy, and those who attain it develop a stronger, more confident self because more of their psychic energy has been invested successfully in goals they themselves had chosen to pursue. When a person is able to organize his or her consciousness so as to experience flow as often as possible, the quality of life is inevitably going to improve because, as in the case of Rico and Pam, even the usually boring routines of work become purposeful and enjoyable. In flow, we are in control of our psychic energy, and everything we do adds order to consciousness. One of our respondents, a well-known West Coast rock climber, explains concisely the tie between the avocation that gives him a profound sense of flow and the rest of his life. It's exhilarating to come closer and closer to self-discipline. You make your body go and everything hurts. Then you look back in awe at the self, at what you've done, it just blows your mind. It leads to ecstasy, to self-fulfillment. If you win these battles enough, that battle against yourself, at least for a moment, it becomes easier to win the battles in the world. 
The battle is not really against the self, but against the entropy that brings disorder to consciousness. It is really a battle for the self. It is a struggle for establishing control over attention. The struggle does not necessarily have to be physical, as in the case of the climber. But anyone who has experienced flow knows that the deep enjoyment it provides requires an equal degree of disciplined concentration. Complexity and the growth of the self. Following a flow experience, the organization of the self is more complex than it had been before. It is by becoming increasingly complex that the self might be said to grow. Complexity is the result of two broad psychological processes, differentiation and integration. Differentiation implies a movement toward uniqueness, toward separating oneself from others. Integration refers to its opposite, a union with other people, with ideas and entities beyond the self. A complex self is one that succeeds in combining these opposite tendencies. The self becomes more differentiated as a result of flow because overcoming a challenge inevitably leaves a person feeling more capable, more skilled. As the rock climber said, you look back in awe at the self, at what you've done, it just blows your mind. After each episode of flow, a person becomes more of a unique individual, less predictable, possessed of rarer skills. Complexity is often thought to have a negative meaning, synonymous with difficulty and confusion. That may be true, but only if we equate it with differentiation alone. Yet complexity also involves a second dimension, the integration of autonomous parts. A complex engine, for instance, not only has many separate components, each performing a different function, but also demonstrates a high sensitivity because each of the components is in touch with all the others. Without integration, a differentiated system would be a confusing mess. Flow helps to integrate the self because in that state of deep concentration, consciousness is unusually well-ordered. Thoughts, intentions, feelings, and all the senses are focused on the same goal. Experience is in harmony, and when the flow episode is over, one feels more together than before, not only internally, but also with respect to other people and to the world in general. In the words of the climber whom we quoted earlier, there's no place that more draws the best from human beings than a mountaineering situation. Nobody hassles you to put your mind and body under tremendous stress to get to the top. Your comrades are there, but you all feel the same way anyway. You're all in it together. Who can you trust more in the 20th century than these people? People after the same self-discipline as yourself, following the deeper commitment. A bond like that with other people is in itself an ecstasy. A self that is only differentiated, not integrated, may attain great individual accomplishments, but risks being mired in self-centered egotism. By the same token, a person whose self is based exclusively on integration will be connected and secure, but lack autonomous individuality. Only when a person invests equal amounts of psychic energy in these two processes and avoids both selfishness and conformity is the self likely to reflect complexity. The self becomes complex as a result of experiencing flow. Paradoxically, it is when we act freely, for the sake of the action itself rather than for ulterior motives, that we learn to become more than what we were. When we choose a goal and invest ourselves in it to the limits of our concentration, whatever we do will be enjoyable. And once we have tasted this joy, we will redouble our efforts to taste it again. This is the way the self grows. It is the way Rico was able to draw so much out of his ostensibly boring job on the assembly line, or R from his poetry. It is the way E overcame her disease to become an influential scholar and a powerful executive. Flow is important both because it makes the present instant more enjoyable and because it builds the self-confidence that allows us to develop skills and make significant contributions to humankind. The rest of this volume will explore more thoroughly what we know about optimal experiences, how they feel and under what conditions they occur. Even though there is no easy shortcut to flow, it is possible, if one understands how it works, to transform life, to create more harmony in it, and to liberate the psychic energy that otherwise would be wasted in boredom or worry.